Assalamu alaikum. We are live. Assalamu to everyone that's already been on. Uh, apologies for starting a couple of minutes late. Brother Yusuf uh, distracted me with something uh, phenomenal, uh, which, which I, I'm pretty sure I can't mention right now, but he's working on something which is brilliant, which is coming very soon. Uh, he's working with someone on something that's going to be coming out very soon for the Dawa. Uh, it, it looks phenomenal. Uh, that being said, Salam bro. How's it going? Alhamdulillah. It's good. How are you? Alhamdulillah, bro. Very good. Very good, bro. Uh, it's been a while since we did a live stream together. Uh, yeah. I did my first, actually, my first live was with you, mashallah. I think it's about over a month ago now. Yeah, it's like that. I'm sure you've done it a couple beforehand. But it was like maybe yeah, the first we did actually, there was no, no, there was one on your channel as well that we did initially. But yeah, they yeah. went live though. We did them pre-recorded and then pre-recorded. Yes, yes, panda. Yeah. But bro, we, we we got one today, and it's going to be an interesting one because we're touching upon a topic which, uh, to be honest, bro, we ha I haven't heard much about, but it's something that's that's gradually been been in increasing in popularity. Loads of people have been speaking about it. Uh, what's very interesting is that there is a lot of a lot of people that ascribe to the total materialist outlook on life they are the ones that are sort of jumping onto this bandwagon a bit more uh, and that is the topic of transhumanism and what i wanted to do today bro is i wanted to sort of pick your brains and just have a discussion about you know what is transhumanism how does it fit in with atheism materialism are there any links do there seem to be any links uh you know is there any is there any uh problem amongst these different sort of ideologies and outlooks on life? How does this all tie in with Islam? So I want to just have a little, sort of a broad discussion on this. What does transhumanism even mean going forward for humanity, right? Yeah. So very interesting questions um, that we're going to discuss. So before we get into it, bro, uh, why don't you give us your sort of, give us a general sort of summary of what you make of this whole movement. What is it? What is transhumanism first? Let's, let's define terms first, I guess. So no, what, what do we talk about when we're talking about transhumanism? Well, transhumanism is uh, the idea of kind of transcending being human. Um, so it, it, there's, it's underpinned by a sort of techno utopianism um, or techno optimism. So basically, uh, it's this idea that technology is something great, um, and that you know the more it develops and the more uh, we kind of adapt technology uh, to our needs eventually we'll um it's not like because at the moment we're just sort of using technology outside of ourselves um you know like you're using your computer your phone and things like that transhumanism is sort of this idea where technology starts to become ingrained into the human body um you know so you, you see um the in these films where people have like a bionic arm mm -hmm. um you know a bionic eyes or like bionic parts basically um and so transhumanism is, is this kind of leaving the material body behind um, to incorporate ourselves with technology uh, in a way that enhances the human being. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess at that point, when we hit that mark, um, th that would mark like that would basically set a new point in the history of the human being mm -hmm. um, in in terms of its development. And from the evolutionary perspective, it becomes something new. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, That's very interesting to put the, the time with evolution. I want to discuss that with you uh, uh, going forward. But I, th I think essentially, because as far as I understand it, there are a few different perspectives on transhumanism. So it's, it's, as it means slightly different things to different people. So yeah. one of the views is, uh, well, there's different categories, if you like. One of the views is, uh, which seems to be a bit more realistic, is the view that we, we merge with technology in a way where it enhances the human being from the perspective of, health, uh, longevity, uh, you know, less illnesses, you don't get the illnesses related to age, etc. You just become a, a superhuman uh, that's been, that's been, uh, that's somehow tied in with technology, but in a way where technology is benefiting you directly as a biological creature, right? But then you yeah. have the more, you have the sort of more, what I call the wacko, crazy end of the spectrum where you've got the guys that we are talking about uploading you know consciousness to some sort of on you know to, to some sort of machines or, or yeah, yeah. integrating human and the human with the machine in a way where your consciousness is somehow embedded into machinery or some some form That's of like the matrix some, yeah it's there somewhere which means that you literally live on forever uh whereas your body your, your physical biological body dies now what i'm more interested in what, what i where i want to take the discussion eventually is is the, the why question why is there this craze for this for this for the human being to want to live on forever 
uh, and how that ties in with Islam and how that ties in with human nature. But before we get there, bro, let's sort of, let's sort of play off these two ideas now. So as far as human beings, bro, benefiting from technology to the point where they live longer, live healthier, um, have less illnesses and diseases. What do you make of this? Is this, is this, a, a, do you think this is a reality? This is something that can happen. Uh, do you see any issues with this ethically, uh, you know, from a philosophical perspective? What do you make of this? Let's, let's deal with that aspect of yeah. transhumanism first. Inshallah. Well, there's two ways of approaching it. Um, Funnily enough, you, you only messaged me this today, but I, I've been reading, like I, I started a book club and we were reading a book called Nihilism and Technology. And he touches on this um, by the, an author called Nolan Gertz. Um, and he outlines basically that you, you can approach this either from uh, like a techno optimism. So like you just see technology as a friend. Um, you, it doesn't really cause you much anxiety. Um, in fact, you're, it fills you with hope. And you know, like, it makes you happy to think that technology is uh, developing. And then there's the the techno pessimism, um, which is characterized basically by this kind of wariness of technology, this fear of what technology is doing. Um, and both of these boats are basically two sides of the the, the same coin, um, and they they look at each other in in a particular way. So the, the techno optimist looks at the like the anti-technology um, individual is someone who uh, just doesn't understand technology. You know, he's back, oh, he's stuck in the old times and he, he's just, he's, he's afraid of something he doesn't know. Um, whereas the, the techno pessimist says, um, well, no, the, the optimist uh, doesn't know what it means to be human and hasn't thought or reflected on, you know, what it, what it, what it is that makes us human in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and this kind of hope to have like s sort of benefits from technology to adapt to be able to live longer, um, not just in terms of lifespan as well, but um, the quality of life, uh, the the extension of the human ability. So um, like th there's these ideas, like you've you've seen the Matrix, haven't you? Where it's like I want to learn kung fu, and it's just yeah, yeah. stick something into his head, and he's learned it. Um, there's there is a bit of a naivety as far as I'm concerned. I'm probably leaning more towards the techno pessimist way of like um, viewing these things because I think we we so, we sort of get giddy on technology um, without and we and we just kind of we make something and we just implement it in society without really questioning or reflecting whether or not it's going to be good for us. And we and we see this with social media. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they were like, yeah, social media is going to make us all so much more like sociable. Yeah. And then um, we got it. And then everyone just kind of sits in their the bedrooms. Like families don't really chill together because they're too busy yeah. being sociable, um, you know, with people on the other side of the planet. Um, and for all in terms of purpose, you're just looking at this like kind of block of material. And um, it's not necessarily beneficial. Yeah. Um, like you know, you you look at the example of shoes. Um, yeah, they're they're useful and they protect your feet, but they also make your feet weaker mm -hmm. as well, and you become reliant upon them. Um, and if like you walk for too long, you get blisters. Whereas you get the people that you know the the tribal people that live in the Aboriginal, um, in the Amazon jungles and things like that. They walk around barefoot, and their feet are like rhino skin. Like they they can they have um, having not had technology their bodies have become stronger as a mm -hmm. result of that and it's not clear that we're going to necessarily become stronger with it it's more likely i think anyway that we're going to become more dependent upon technology yeah. more addicted to it more um and and the more we depend on it and the more we are dependent upon it the weaker we become as a result of that dependency um and not just that like when you think in terms of back in the day if you needed to learn something, you had to memorize it. This isn't the ethos in primary schools now or in high schools um, or in schools in general. When you're studying something, it's not you're not necessarily studying to, to remember it, to memorize it. And one of the reasons is because you feel like, oh, I don't, what do I need to remember anything for? I've got an iPhone, I can Google. Yeah. Um, you know, the internet will memorize things for me. Um, but the issue with that is that if when you memorize things, um, you're able to recall them when it's relevant. If you're not memorizing, you can't do that. 
So like if you if you're very familiar, like people, you know, half is at the Quran. Um, not just people who've memorized um like the sounds, but know the meaning of the words as well. Um when they're talking to people and they're doing dawah, um, because they have it memorized, when a, a particular question arises, when a particular thing happens to pop up, uh, they can recall it instantly. Yeah. And, bam, and it's and it's useful and it, and and that really helps in terms of how the conversation flows as well in, in terms of building rapport and relationship with people. Um, whereas if you've not memorized it, if you're relying on your phone, you get this awkward moment where you're like, oh, one second, I've just yeah. got to let me find that quote. And then you're pulling up and you're trying to search it and like yeah. it, it disrupts the conversation. Um, but, you know, but that's a result of a dependency yeah. um, of kind of offloading your processing um, abilities onto a machine. Yeah. And uh, as, as far as I kind of look at it, it's not necessarily a good thing. If anything, I think it's um, something we should be wary of, something that's going to affect us and something that's going to give um, a, a people that don't rely on such things as much an advantage over us. Um, I'd, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Like, are you do you incline towards like an optimism? No, I, think you, I think what you said is quite interesting, bro. Is that the, we the dependency upon technology is actually making us weaker from so many perspectives. And some of this we experience in our own lives. I mean, when you're driving to to a new place, and I was thinking of this when you were saying this. So you're driving to a new place, and suddenly your battery dies. You don't have a charger. You're you're pretty much in a in a in a very difficult situation now because you don't know where you're going. You know, we're not accustomed to maps and directions as, for example, our parents were. When mm. they didn't have sat navs, for example, right? Or, Guiding by the stars. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, bro. And and when we look at the stars, I mean, it blows your mind that it's the, when it makes you think: How in the world can you use the stars to be directed and guided? And how they did this, right? Because it's not like the stars are literally holding the same position throughout the year; they shift depending on obviously the the, the tilt of the Earth, etc. So it, it's a very interesting perspective that. I, and what you've mentioned as well, which is that I don't think most, sometimes at least people don't consider the, the full spectrum of impact uh, that a particular technology is going to have when it's implemented. And yeah. then we learn the hard way by actually experiencing the negative effects as well. Phones are a brilliant example. I mean, even in Ramadan, bro, how many times I, don't, I found myself doing this where you could have been using your time better, but you're on your phone. And the times yeah. you deliberately try to put it aside, you struggle. And that's yeah, when you realize how much how dependent you are on this this like you said a, a piece of literally a piece of block yeah, yeah. plastic and glass in your hands. You know, it's very interesting. Um, it's annoying as well because I can I I've, I think about this a lot. So it's not like I, I'm not reflecting on it or not conscious of the fact that it's happening. Um, but like I, I was doing, I'll do tarawi, and like you're doing two sets of twos, and like I'll find that once I've done two sets. The first thing my arm does is it's like reaches out for the phone and like <laughs> and then I'm like checking notifications and things like that and like and it annoys me when I'm, I see myself doing it yeah. um and I'm like no what am I doing and then I'll put it away and then I'll have to I'll try and concentrate and then my mind drifts yeah. um and then you know I'll finish the prayer and then again like arm goes straight to the phone or to the tablet or so, so sometimes I'll have like two phones yeah. and like I'll be doing one thing on one and another on another and yeah, like it, but it's 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 scary, bro. When you think about it, man, it's like something you 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 rather reach for the phone than a glass of water, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and 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 I've, I've caught myself doing that at points, and I'm thinking, what's going on here? And then it makes you reflect, wow, you know, the the impact this is having on your spiritual life, and the time that you can could be using, doing something in a way that you could connect to Allah better. You are spending on, you you you're engrossing yourself more on the worldly life. That's that's problematic, man. And yeah. then it makes you think, is this is there an element of this which is deliberate? And that's another question in and of itself. So, yeah, any, anyway, let's, there's, there's another thing. There's a question here before we go on to the next point, bro. Mukit Khan, he wants to ask, he says, does Yusuf think there is a romanticized version of transhumanism in Hollywood media, specifically science fiction, to create a man-made evolution and delay the destroyers of pleasure, death? This is, this is essentially what we're, we're going to get to. Uh, but what do you think, bro, of the question? Uh, there definitely is. And th there's not just a romanticized version. Th there is this pessimistic idea of it as well. Like you see it with the whole doomsday scenario. The AI will take over. There's, yes. there's so many of these films. Um, Terminator, um, that other Robo one, is it? Space Robo Odyssey. Robocop. Robocop's a very popular one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. but, but there's, there's all of these films that kind of, they show it as not necessarily romanticized. Um, because 
like I said, I incline towards the pessimism, um, but it's not that I completely neglect that there is sort of benefits to it as well. Um, mm -hmm. There clearly is. Like things do become easier. Like me and you having the conversation now would be so much more difficult if it wasn't for the internet and for yeah. our devices and things like that. Um, maybe we wouldn't have ever even met mm -hmm. if it wasn't for you know our, our ability to kind of transcend space here with our devices and just kind of skip all the miles it is between Manchester and London. Um, you know, so there are benefits, there are uses. Uh, it brings people together. Um, you know, th there's all sorts of positive things. Um, and maybe Hollywood is contributing to both sides. Maybe it, it's um, pushing a sort of, uh, what's the word? Maybe it's feeding both sides, basically. Maybe mm. it's making those who are already inclining towards pessimism to be more pessimistic, to be more panicky about the whole thing. Yeah. Um, and maybe those who are already inclined towards being, you know, having a romanticized view of technology, maybe it feeds that for them. Mm. Um, but it's it's not. I wouldn't say it's specifically doing one and neglecting the other. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's such a chaotic industry that they they pretty much dip into everything. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's it's not so much just the one side. Yeah. in answer to that question uh, in regards to the second bit um to create man-made evolution and delays the destroy of pleasure death um maybe but well, this is the idea as well because it's you see after the, the quote-unquote death of god in society um you you see these other political systems start to arise so um when you look at say marxism how they kind of moved paradise away from the heavens after death into the future on, on this world. Um, they didn't get rid of it. The capitalists, uh, so, and that was like a communal paradise, you know, for the Marxists, the communists. Um, for the capitalists, paradise was an individual thing. Um, and it wasn't, it was in the future of your life. And, uh, you know, that was, you know, what you, if you work hard enough, you'll get to be the CEO, you'll get everything you want. Um, not everyone achieves it. But th there's still these ideas of like paradise that remained after um the end of uh you know faith in europe or in the west uh transhumanism is is similar in that way it's uh you know it, it's this kind of becoming immortal or moving yeah. towards that it's this idea of becoming um more powerful becoming gods almost is you know yeah. there's the underlying desire um that's exactly what uh you find people like uh noble harari uh in his book sapiens he mentions the very same thing uh, uh, John Gray in Seven Types of Atheism, he 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 quotes him and he mentions the same thing. It's like it's, you're going from uh, Homo sapien to Homo Deus. You know, you you you're becoming uh, literally. It's that next stage in the evolution of man, which is progressing towards when man himself becomes or wants to become God, right? Or have godlike uh, abilities from some perspective. And and also the point you're making about the idea of an eternal life or a paradise that goes on, it was never really removed completely. You know, even with nihilism, it just took on a different shape. It took on a different form. It went from being the life you're going to go to once you die here and you move on to the eternal, to an eternal life that goes on forever. Uh, it went from that and then it shifted to being, no, you're going to have that life here. Yeah. And you can see that you can see, you can see the, the appeal of that type of view from a capitalist type of Marxist perspective because it gets people to focus on the, the, the immediate life and, and feed into the system. So it all works well from that perspective. Uh, and that's why you see it in Nietzsche, you see it with Marx. They, they, had, they detested the idea of the otherworldly, uh, the, the concept of a hereafter, that you're going to move on somewhere. But what they couldn't do, they couldn't shake out that reality from the from, from what, what, the way I see it, from the nature of human, the human being, which is there is an element of the nature of the human being that wants to live on forever. And, and, and you get this in the Quran as well, bro. For example, in the seventh chapter, uh, I don't remember exactly what verse it is, what ayah is in the, in the seventh chapter. If someone that's watching right now that knows the specific verse, please reference it. Where we go back to the story of uh, Adam and where Satan lured him into eating from that tree. And the, the way he convinces him is very interesting, bro. The, the way he convinces him, what he says to him, he says, the only reason God doesn't want you to eat from this tree is less that you become an angel or that you become immortal, right? Yeah. And, and, and that seems to be a very interesting ploy by Satan. And he, he seems to realize that it's a part of the nature of man to want to desire to live on forever. 
And that's what we're seeing being expressed even today. And I, I really believe one of the underlying, because for me, bro, I always like going to the roots, like why, what's the why behind this? What is yeah. driving people to want to live on forever? And and it's, I, I, I want to get your thoughts on a very particular point here, bro. Keep that in mind, just in case I forget, please, bro. Where, you know, how that, 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 that tension between nihilism and wanting to live on forever, because on one end, there seems to be no reason from a materialistic atheist perspective to want to live on and want to do anything or, or, or any drive or motivation to do anything. Yet at the same time, the very same people want to live on forever. Uh, and they want to for this to be realized through transhumanism and these types of ideas. So there seems to be a bit of a contradiction there. And I want to get your thoughts yeah. on that. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was something else you wanted to add, or I uh, know. So, so it's it's it, the point. The, the, I guess the point I was getting at is that there is an element of human nature that wants to live on forever, and they want that actualized in this world. Yeah. Hence, we see this drive and this 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 expression uh, of this through ideas such as transhumanism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It doesn't uh, necessarily have to be in this world. It's just it has to be soon. Um, yeah. You know, so even like this idea of like uploading your consciousness onto computers. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's still this idea of kind of transcending. Um, and it doesn't have to be here, but it's um, the human being is a paradox. We have this desire to live forever, um, but it's conditional. It's um, we 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 wouldn't have the desire to live forever if that living forever was painful, or if that if that living forever was suffering. Um, Nolan Gertz in his book he outlines an issue, um, something to be concerned about with techno optimism is that it it's underpinned by seeing. Uh, life as a problem, as being human, um, sorry, it sees being human as an issue, as something to look down upon um, mm. and something that needs to be fixed. Um, and basically, we use technology to help overcome problems and to basically, we, you know, to, as, a, as a way of creating solutions to things that we find undesirable. Um, to things we would rather avoid. Now, uh, there's a little quote I'll just read here. So, uh, Norman Goetz says, using technologies to try to create a problem-free world, a world where we can avoid problematic and undesirable experiences, can also be seen, therefore, as using technologies to try to create a reflection-free world. So this is key here. Mm -hmm. um, a world where we can avoid problematic and undesirable questions. Now, the thing you need to keep in mind here is that when you use technology to resolve a problem, it's not that the um, the fundamental issue has been resolved. Technologies hide problems. So, uh, you know, for example, the technologies that we have that um, allow us to have convenience stores around the corner and our fridges filled with food that doesn't go off very quickly. Um, like all of these things uh, kind of hide the fact that we um if if they disappear that, that we're in trouble uh, like what what do we do at that point um how how do we provide food because another thing is is because we're isolated in our houses especially now with the lockdown uh what this is doing and and technology makes it easier for us to be in our houses and not have to leave um we can still get our social uh desires um fulfilled and things like that what we neglect is um, being inside of a house kind of hides how many people there are around us, how many people there are in each house, on each street, on each estate. And there's thousands and thousands of them. And how reliant all these people are on particular points of um, supply. So, you know, the, the superstores that are there and things like that. Now, if all of these things collapse for whatever reason, mm -hmm. um, you know, or they're taken away from us, that, that, that problem hasn't been resolved. The, the issue of the human being, its needs were always present. Technology didn't actually provide a solution. It provided, um, you know, just a means of kind of fulfilling it momentarily yeah. uh, for as long as we can make it last. But yeah. the problem is still there. And the, you know that the problem is still there because if these things go away, mm. the, the, the fact that there's a problem becomes self-evident. Now what do we do? Now we have to start hunting pigeons and rats and bugs and frogs and stuff like we would have to adapt and try to figure out a way uh to resolve these problems again um yeah. now technology has a habit of doing this it, it covers problems rather than actually 
um, resolving them. And I think that's more to do with the fact um, of us just being a human being. These things end up being inescapable. They're, they're, they are what it means to be human. Um, but the issue is, is when you grow up in a world where technology has resolved these problems, you stop, um, you don't know what to, ref you don't know to reflect on them because, you know, they're not present. These problems are not popping up in your life. Um, and so here he's saying, like he's said, you're creating a reflection-free world. So these problems give rise to reflection. They give rise to you thinking about what it means to be a human being. Um, but insofar as these problems are being, quote unquote, fulfilled by technology, um, yeah. there, there is no motivation to reflect on the causes of these problems. And so you end up becoming blind to what it means to be a human. Um, there's another interesting thing that he kind of points out in that. Um, so do, should we move on to the second, next point, bro? Just on that. Yeah. So I, I, what, we, what you're getting at basically is that it's the idea that's sold to you is that technology is going to make things better and it has and it will continue to do so. But when you really sit down and think about it, well, that's not necessarily the case because there, it, sometimes it exacerbates that problem that you're trying to deal with, right? So, yeah. and sometimes it may create new problems as well. So it's not, it's not literally a linear type of clear, straight path uh, that, that, that's, you know, towards progress from that perspective. Yeah, right? yeah. And, and, and according to you, if I'm not understanding you wrong, it, what you're saying is that one of the reasons is because there's not enough thought that that's, goes into all of this before actually putting something out there, right? Um, but it's difficult to, this is the problem, because yeah. you can't really know what you don't know. <laughs> of everything, right? Yeah. 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 And, and it, there's um, a good analogy here in like, like my daughter, she just, if, if you would let her, she would just eat sweets all day long and chocolate and like, She'd just be like, but, and, and when the reason is, is because when she's doing it, all mm. she can do is hone in on what's enjoyable from it. All she can do is like focus on the, the good out of it. Yeah. Um, and and the, the thing is, is this blinds her to all the other things that are happening around it that come with it. If you allow that behavior to, to go unhindered. Yeah. Um, and there's a similar thing with technology. We like, and we're, we're naive. Like the child is, we, you know, we've not experienced um this before there's there's no past um civilization that we can look at that's had to deal with what we're dealing with now like th th there are maybe some similarities say with the roman empire um yeah. even the you, Egyptians, maybe, even the Egyptians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can maybe draw some analogies between them but nothing to the extent that we're dealing with today like the the transformation of society has, has been exponential and it's continuing to be exponential and it's continuing to get crazier Mm -hmm. um and you know allah well and what's in store over the next few decades yeah. but what's happening is is we like the child of the sweets we're focusing in so much on the things that we want or the things that we we think are good um that we're, we're becoming blind to things to mm -hmm. we're becoming blind to the issues that are arising with this and there are certain people in society who who, who can see this happening and they point it out mm -hmm. um but there's another consequence technology is also given rise to um huge numbers of people and what that does is it, it makes it very difficult to get your voice heard over the crowd and so even if these people do exist that are noticing these issues they're being drowned out yeah by so much because there's this idea of um in pop culture at the moment like oh don't listen to the haters don't you know like all, all this um cliched nonsense or it's like mm -hmm. yeah just be you don't like it. Don't let anyone change who you are. Like th th this is absurd advice that you give anyone. Like, like for example, with this idea that if you get married, that whoever you get married to is just going to be happy with who you are. That you know, it's going to be this kind of Disney princess um, and prince relationship where like everything's hunky dory, and that's that's what kind of relationship you'd be aiming at. This perfect idealistic thing where they accept you for who you are and don't want to change you. That's the worst kind of relationship. Because maybe you're not perfect. This is yeah. something Jordan Peterson touches on. Like maybe you have a lot of issues, and if people just keep telling you that you're okay, that you're perfect as you are, then there's there's no motivation to make yourself better. There's no motivation to fix the things that are wrong with you. Mm. And any attempt for anyone to kind of like point this out to you, it makes you lash out at them. Yeah. And you see this kind of relationship happening on a societal scale in terms of this kind of techno optimism, techno pessimism. Um, you know, that maybe there is 
lots of good things we can say about technology. Um, but then the question is, is like, uh, hold on though, is like, <laughs> is living for 200 years really going to be that great yeah. for us? Um, yeah, that's, that's, so that, that's bringing me on to, uh, let me put the question to you here then, bro. Do you think being a part of a, 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 a society and a culture which is inherently nihilistic and that's moved away from the Judeo-Christian tradition, at least from the Western perspective. And, and, and therefore, pretty much we live in a world where essentially anything goes or it's moving towards that direction. Is that exacerbating the problem uh, when it comes to technology? Does that make things worse from the perspective that, you know, like, for example, uh, Sartre, uh, met, spoke about because with him like you know one of the biggest issues was uh okay so there is no there is no meaning to life there is no essence and for him that wasn't the big problem the big problem was the the, the what scared him was the idea of this freedom now yeah. and and, and uh, what we do with this freedom and and therefore you spoke extensively about being responsible and you know being virtuous etc cetera, etc cetera. but is is that the same problem that faces us from this perspective as well now when it comes to technology? That yes. is the, the world's your oyster. You, yeah, you, yeah, there yeah. is no ethical, like, uh, there's no ought that's pressing down on you anymore. Well, it, it's 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 interesting because, like, basically, funnily enough, what happens is after he kind of outlines um, in his book, Nolan Gertz, this issue um, with a problem free world becoming a reflection free world, uh, he then moves on to. Uh, chapter one, which he, he calls uh, leisure as liberation. And technology kind of sells a, a particular way of life. And, mm -hmm. you know, you see the adverts, they're like, oh, like your life is going to be so much better when you have this phone. Your life is going to be so much better. And they do such a good job yeah. at selling this to you. Like uh, I was watching uh, Adnan uh, live on um, Instagram, and he was talking about how the, the new iPad came out and they made him want it. And he was like, oh, like, I've got to get it. I've got to get it. And um, he went and got it. And like he said, to begin with, he treated it like it was like, you know, really, really special. New, newborn baby. <laughs> uh, and uh, we, I can relate because I, I did the same thing with like. But my, we all do, bro. Yeah. This, it's yeah. a part, and this was interesting. It's a part of human nature. It's like and the, it's like the people that are constructing these ads and 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 putting this stuff out. They, they understand human nature and human psychology to a very deep level, bro, wouldn't you say? They, they, they know how we work and how we function. Yeah. And that's being exploited from some perspectives as well. Well, it's, 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 it's this idea that technology is going to free us. It's, it's, um, and not just free us, with that freedom, it's then going to be able to extend our capacities to be free. It's going to give us the ability to act on the world exactly the way we want to. Now, there's again, there's a bit of a naivety with this. Um, firstly it's not it's not necessarily obvious that we enjoy being free like you, you alluded to there with Sartre that freedom is a burden freedom yeah. is uh is difficult to deal with because then you've got the responsibility of having to make choices um and he kind of he ends up saying maybe human beings uh like having a boss maybe human beings like being told what to do um maybe because then they have uh, someone to blame or someone to, you know, like it, when you've got um, this kind of, you see it at the moment with this sort of reliance upon the government to fix problems. Something will happen and they're like, why isn't the government sorting this out? How can this happen? And it's like, wait, there's, there's some, there's old people like starving on your estate and you, you want to blame it on the government. Like, what, what, <laughs> have you got no responsibility as a neighbor? For checking in on these people like wh why is it the government's fault how is the government even supposed to know that these people are in there mm. like do you understand what kind of task you're putting on this small group of people like in one particular part of the country for, for everyone here maybe there's an issue with like offloading uh this responsibility onto other people but, but there, there is this common thing going on um where you see it express itself in um this sort of not really wanting to be free while waving the freedom flag. Um, yeah. And he, what he says is that um, we use technology as a, as a sort of, to, um, it, we use it to hypnotize ourselves. Um, and the reason we use it to hypnotize ourselves is because we can't face uh, the burden of consciousness. We can't face the burden of being free. And so these technologies start to develop um, things like Netflix, um, which give you the ability to just binge watch entire seasons 
for ages. And uh, effectively what that does is it makes you zone out. You don't have to focus on life, on the issues at hand, on what you've got to do, on goals, on making, you know, like mm -hmm. and aiming into the future and, and trying to progress and move towards that. Whether you're an atheist and you're just looking in terms of like where you want to be when you're older or whether you're a theist and like you're trying to determine like how you're going to live in, in a way that's going to give you access into the into paradise. Um, these technologies are kind of facilitating not having to deal with that. Um, you know, and, and that's with Netflix, it's with YouTube, it's with all of these things. And yeah, um, yeah and, and so he just, he basically refers to it as a sort of uh, self-hypnosis um, or a techno-hypnosis that we are choosing to do in mm -hmm. order to avoid uh, being conscious. And you, you, yeah. you see even developing in games, you know, like um, Pokemon Go and things like that. You, there's a way of like, making you feel like you're being active and engaging in the world. Yeah. Um, but then th that very same thing that's professing that it's going to get you out there, it's going to get you dealing with the world, has to have a warning on the screen when you start to play it to tell you to be careful not to get run over mm. um, and be careful that you don't um, lure yourself into a corner where people can mug you. And Because yeah. th things that it was, uh, it, he even pointed out, th these kind of games, they marked a point where there was a flip where back in the day, you used to be the controller of the game. There was an avatar on a screen and you would move um, these avatars about. And so you, you would be engrossed in this thing and you would have some sort of um, power over that thing. Whereas with these new games, these the, that relationship's been inversed and these things are controlling you. So mm -hmm. the games, Pokemon Go and things like that, they're um, making you go to places the, the the relationship is that the device is is controlling you as an avatar and making you traverse the world and mm -hmm. making you engross yourself in that technology so much that you don't even notice the world around you mm -hmm. to the degree that it becomes a danger to your own life and that they mm -hmm. have to put warnings on there. Uh, criminals were using it to lure people to a place that was out of the way um, and where they were vulnerable. And so then you would have people that would go looking for Pokemon, not thinking not reflecting, you know, like they'd zone out of life and the world to go try and catch some rare Pokemon, uh, like in the middle of a dark park on a Friday night. And there would be criminals waiting there to yeah. mug them. And in effect, the criminals have hacked this, hacked, I mean it in like a very loose sense, um, this game and pretty much <laughs> used it as a controller to get their victims to come to them. Yeah, it's like, like people are plugged in already, bro. But but see, this is the th interesting thing now because I'm I'm juxtaposing this with these sort of liberal ideas that we're you know we're sold today. So it's almost like it seems like what's happening is that when, when you're so when the human being sold the idea of freedom, it's it's a certain type of freedom which is appealing to the 21st century human being, and and that's the type of freedom to be free to choose not to choose to act in a responsible way in the world. It's the it's the freedom to choose to to, to plug yourself into a system where you don't have to feel responsible, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's that type of freedom that seems appealing to people and makes them comfortable. But the, but to think of freedom in the way where you're, a, where you're, as Allah says, you're a vice chairman upon earth and you're here to be responsible and to take care of others and to, and to live a good life and do what's good and speak good words and say good things. That type of freedom, people don't want nothing to do it. Uh, and they don't want to engage in that. And I guess there's no motivation to either because... Again, if you remove God and you, there is no creator, you know, it's all just one big accident. You're here, YOLO, you only live once. There is no motivating, driving factor for you to engage in that, if you like, quote unquote, heroic. If you want to look, see it as the heroic or the, the, the selfless archetype, if you like, that, that you yeah. go out there and you're, you're all about living a virtuous life and being a virtuous human being. That, that drive is going to be that type of person, right? It's all become it's freedom from a selfish perspective where all responsibility is removed, all uh, burden is removed, and you're just free to engage in things that give you a that basically stimulate you in a way where you're just zoned out, constantly being zoned out, right? That's essentially yeah, yeah. What you're doing. Um, and, and that, it's easy, that, it's, yeah. it's very easy to do it as well. Like it, it is so easy just to kind of pick up the phone, click on the YouTube app. Yeah, and then just watch some videos, and then before you, or just on Twitter, scrolling endlessly through a feed. Yeah, um, you know, it's that there is pretty much no effort involved in like in having to do that. 
Yeah. And whereas having to not do that and then act on the world and try to like develop yourself and like basically endure suffering willingly, mm -hmm. um, it's a challenge. And this is the issue is that people don't necessarily or they, they fear the challenge because they fear they might they might fail it. They fear that they, you know, that if they they give it a go, what are the chances that I'm gonna win it when there's yeah. like billions of people on the planet now and like um and th it's this seeing life as only suffering rather than as a challenge to overcome is made more difficult by the fact that technology facilitates the opportunity to hypno hypnotize yourself mm. um and it's also giving rise to the increased numbers in the population um which make uh giving it a go seem pointless like yeah. how am i going to be able to go like, like for example when you, you're looking at say some of the the fastest runners on the planet it's mm. like how am I going to be able to compete with them guys? Why even bother doing that? It's, it's a type of laziness, right? It's a type of like, forget it. Um, it's no point. It's like, there's no point. Uh, and, and it seems like it's driven by two factors. One is so many people, how am I ever going to be able to, you know, compete or succeed? And secondly, why even do that in the first place? What reason yeah. do I have to do that? They, again, those things seem to, they, they're stripped from you as soon as you, again, disconnect the human being from its creator uh, well, then, you know, it, there is no innate drive to go out and do these things. Yeah. Uh, what's his name, man? Uh, it's linked as well to there's yeah. a, a, low, a low chance of success, um, but there's a high reward from it. Mm -hmm. um, but then, like, if you're not willing to make that gamble, like, say, if there's a 1%, or not even that, 0 0.001% that you'll succeed at this thing. Um, and then if you do succeed in it, you'll get all this joy. First of all, the joy is fleeting. Mm -hmm. And then second of all, if you don't succeed, you know, that there's um, there's all of the, the pain that's um, that surrounds failing. And, and some people are like, is it really worth it? Should I really risk like a 99.999% chance of failing and suffering and so on and so forth um, j just for the opportunity of maybe getting some fleeting sense of pleasure, which eventually wears off? Um, you know, because it's again, I, I keep making reference to this, the the law of diminishing returns. Um, you, you, with technology, you see it as well. Like people get dead excited about new technology, and it's like we they they hear about it and they think, "Wow, imagine what life is going to be like if yeah. that technology gets made. How much better it's going to be. How much exciting it would be." And it's only exciting from the the standpoint of like you recognize that there's a problem in life. Um, and that this problem needs a solution. And then you, you're presented with a potential solution in this piece of technology. And the, the idea of not having to deal with that problem is the thing that causes the excitement. Now, yep. the problem here is that once that becomes embedded in society and is no longer new, and the problem is something no one ever recognizes anymore because it's not there. Technology has removed that problem. Yep. The excitement of having it removed isn't there anymore because it's not there to be removed. It's already been removed. And yeah. it, it ceases to be something um, you become grateful for or look forward to, and it becomes something normal, and it becomes something expected. And if you take that away, it causes pain, but its presence doesn't mm -hmm. cause you joy. Yep. Presence is just expected now. It's like, like I just expect, like, for example, Wi-Fi. Like, mm. You remember the days when uh, the internet was and you had to like plug the thing in and it made all these mad noises and you had to wait. And when you loaded a page, you had to watch as the uh, the screen would load one pixel line at a time. Yeah. Like that was um, like, with the, like in the nineties when the internet was first available and like we were like, um, or in the early, not even just the nineties, like the early millennium. And uh all of a sudden this idea of wi-fi started coming out and it's like wow and like look i don't need wires to like connect to the it's internet crazy, like, it's it's and broadband and you're like okay that's another step up is also fun. and it was so exciting fiber optics like it, it was so exciting but now like it's not it doesn't bring joy it's just yeah. it's there and yeah. not just that like when it's working and it's working properly as it should do like i don't even notice it like I don't notice when I've got good. It's expected that you expect it yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like it's just part of the background. It might as well be the air that I breathe. Like, 
It should be that. Bro, we need to answer some questions, bro. Some of the brothers and sisters have been waiting patiently. Right, right, right. So I'm going to flick <laughs> some of the questions. We'll take a bit of a break, then we come back to the topic, and then we do questions at the end again. So the okay. first question that I've had up on the screen by YC, uh, he says, epistemics, how do you think evolution ties into this? So transhumanism, et cetera, right? Um, well, here's my take, and I'll get. let me know your, your thoughts on this yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So I looked into this a bit as far as from a historical perspective as well. And this idea of transhumanism, or the idea of where man merges with technology isn't really a new idea. It was something that was quite pushed quite heavily in the in the uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century as well. So you had certain movements during the scientific revolution and 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 and, and that time and, and after as well, uh, where you had this this view where man had to take the evolution into its in, into his own hands from the perspective that you know now at this point in the evolutionary history history it was time for a, a an involvement of conscious evolution where man consciously now engages in the process or interferes in the process and re, and directs it further yeah. so this idea was pushed by huxley as well uh, one of uh, uh, darwin's right hand men right or if he's known as pitbull as well so he he pushed this idea quite heavily where, you know, through his, for example, he had this view called uh, evolutionary humanism. And that tied in with his view as well, which was the idea that there are certain superior races. Obviously, there's a lot of racism in this. And a lot of the Enlightenment thinkers were, were heavily racist in, the, in their thinking as well, which is not mentioned. And when you read works on, Enli on the Enlightenment period, etc. But the view was that, you know, one of the views he had was that we have to move forward. And the way we're going to progress is where, 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 where technology somehow starts to merge with humanity. Uh, this was also pushed in sort of early views of monism. And what they wanted to essentially achieve was it was all based on the idea of progress that, you know, and they tied the idea of progress with evolution where, where Darwin himself rejected this idea. If you read his writings, his, his whole thing was that, or his whole objective was to remove teleology from his model because he wanted to sort of give you a model which removed meaning. Right or, or meaning attached to it. So, but Huxley introduced meaning back into it and other writers at the time in, in the 19th century and the 20th, 20th century, where they, have, they, they introduced this idea of progress. So, humanity evolution is about progress, and it's progressing the this the the different um, life forms. And human beings are the most developed life form, and now they need to progress further. And the way they're going to progress further is by becoming one with technology in one way, shape, or form. Um, so that idea was there, although the idea of progress doesn't tie in with technology in any way, shape or form. Now, this idea of progress also is a part of the world that, that we live in, right? If you look at it from any perspective, it's all about progress. It's all about moving forward, whether you look at it from an economic perspective or any other perspective. So that's, that idea, it was, it was always there. There was the, 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 the birth of transhumanism was there in the, in the late 19th and early 20th century. But now what we see is it's, it's obviously with technology and the development of technology, and uh, you know, with 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 therefore, there's new views and ideas that people have now going forward. We have this new version of uh, these views, which is which is which is arisen in the form of transhumanism. And like we said, one of the ideas, and there's many ideas in, in transhumanist philosophy. One of them is where human beings, as we are, we benefit from uh, technology, where in in a way where it does interact with us, where it removes. Uh, such sense so so the removal of diseases we become inte more intelligent more rational we become more we live longer uh you know we don't get as many diseases we become superhumans right so that we've touched upon and then the, the other more extreme end as, as i said uh, where i want to go now after the q a section is the extreme end of the spectrum which is we become one with technology from the perspective that our consciousness is uploaded and therefore we live on forever uh, and we'll engage with that question in a second. What's your take on this, bro? How does it tie in with evolution? Where is, where is, where have you looked into it? Where's the tie in with evolution and transhumanism? Yeah, well, it's also characterized by this kind of like, th there's assumptions on what progression is. Um, and Nietzsche, he, he used to say, rather than saying, um, like asking if we are progressing, uh, he, he wanted to kind of explore how do we define progress? Um, cause it's, it's not clear, um, that just because we have this assumption about what progress is, that that necessarily means you're progressing in the right direction or in, in a direction that's going to benefit you necessarily. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's one thing. And the other thing, it, it's kind of characterized by this impatience. Um, so I would say we kind of recognize 
that change occurs. Um, and we recognize that there are problems, like I've mentioned, and that um, we seek solutions to these problems. And we, we've started to see technology can do that for us. But at the same time, we're sort of resentful to technology um, because we want the benefits that it gives us without having to rely on it. Um, and so we, we want to kind of use technology to help us to transcend technology. And so this is this idea of kind of aiming at maybe trying to upload. Um, obviously, this is this very small group of people that like kind of maybe even think this might happen. Um, but th there's this sort of underlying desire to maybe even offload um, our consciousnesses onto computer and to quote unquote live forever. Mm. Um, and it, it, again, it's just it's evolution in the sense that, um, oh, well, we can now guide ourselves in, in a direction that we want to go. Um, and it's sort of playing God. Um, of, and it, you know, it ties into this idea of wanting to be God or wanting to be powerful, um, wanting to be free, um, but at the same time, not wanting the responsibility. Um, and so there's a conflict within us um, as a result of these weird competing desires that we have simultaneously that don't necessarily aim at the same thing. Or you know, they, um, like the, the desire to kind of progress or become better or become immortal or more free. Um, we have that drive, but we also have a drive to kind of uh, not have as much responsibility, not have as much of a burden. Um, because these, this freedom comes with a responsibility and certain freedoms close other freedom, freedoms down. Um, and so th this kind of process of tying it in with evolution, like how do we develop? Um, all of that depends if we are focusing on what way we're going, um, the question is, is, well, how do we define progress? Because we need to be able to figure that out um, yeah. before we decide which way we wish to progress. Yes. Um, and so th it, this is a weird turn in evolution because it, there wasn't necessarily, you know, from the atheistic perspective, there wasn't consciousness driving evolution. Um, but now we're, we're actively trying to make it so that consciousness does drive evolution again. Um, and we think that we'll be the ones that play a part in that. Mm -hmm. But obviously there's massive issues here because it, it requires hindsight um, to know whether or not these things are necessarily going to be good. Um, yeah. We need to kind of reflect on what it means to be human um, in order to know if these things are going to give rise to issues. Um, and then there's all the issues that you won't know are going to arise until you've took the step. Like you don't know there's um, like sharks in the water necessarily until you've you've gone for a swim yeah. and one tries to eat you, um, and th that's an issue. Uh, so th this, I guess, that's how it ties into evolution. Like, if we're going to start guiding our evolution now, um, how do we determine that guidance? Um, yeah. And how do we? Who do we blame if it goes wrong? Like, yeah. <laughs> and if if we blame people for when it goes wrong and people know that that's going to be the case, they don't necessarily want to take the responsibility to then guide us in a particular direction. Um, you know, these are all weird issues that kind of arise out of thinking about. Give me, um, give me your take on the whole, okay, so because so, we're talking about some some of the sort of issues here now, give me your take on the idea of, on one end, let's focus on, on existential nihilism. So when, from a, from a purely materialistic atheist perspective, okay, there is no ultimate meaning to life, right? The best you mm -hmm. can sort of do is make meaning up for yourself. If there is no meaning to life, if it's all just, you know, whatever, right? We're just here, we're here by accident, we're gonna die. And that's the reality of life. Then where, where how, how do you account for this want or need or desire to want to live on forever? Uh, give me your thoughts on that. How do you think that these two, these two sort of uh, opposites are are being dealt with in people's minds, or in, at least in the minds of the materialist? Um, well, I guess the desire to live forever, um... because we know there's philosophers who wrote on suicide, bro. Like when they really thought it through logically, they're yeah. like, okay, well, even Camus is like one of the options at least is suicide, although that wasn't the one he went with or pushed or promoted, but you know, it's it's probably the most the most rational option from that perspective if you logically follow through. So, and I know people don't live like that, right? Obviously, even atheists would say no. Well, even though there is no ultimate meaning to life, yeah, we just we still live because you know you can derive pleasure, etc. Um, 
but yeah. Anyway, what what you thought? What do you think? Would you th would you well, think? It, that? it might not necessarily be based on the desire of wanting to live forever. It might just be the consequence of not wanting to have the anxiety or the the fear of death. Yeah. Um. So that it, that basically, it's the the primary goal isn't necessarily to live forever. It's just we really don't want to have to experience dying. Um. Mm. You know. Then the thought of that alone is something that terrifies people. Um, well, you know the pain well, that might be involved in it. Painful place to be emotionally, bro, man. Psychologically, on one yeah. end, no reason to live. On the other, on the other end, you don't want to die. It's yeah. so much like a catch twenty-two, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's, it might more be a running away from something than a running towards something. Mm. I because when people put it forward like that, oh yeah, I I want to live forever. Um, like there's not really that much thought that's gone into it. And like whenever you look at any sort of literary, um any books that have been written on this or any films, um, the the immortal on this, in this world at least, um, is, is someone that loses the ability to love anything. Like they, they, they always lose the ability to form connections because they, they fear, they know these connections are going to go mm. and they don't want to go get too close to the people because, you know, those people might die. Now, maybe you can resolve that if everyone's living forever together. Um, mm. But, you know, anyone who's had to live with anybody even for a short period of time, knows that it's difficult, like, <laughs> for years, let alone for, like, an eternity. Um, and that, a lot of that's tied to, like, th this world and, like, our bodies and how we are here. Um, mm. Maybe technology might, you know, if, if they could develop that kind of thing, that maybe it could resolve it. Um, yeah. But it, it doesn't necessarily resolve... Um, issues that I don't think technology can go into. So for example, the desire for somebody, um, you see uh, that they're trying to do this in Japan at the moment with these kind of like virtual girlfriends um, mm. or these little apps that you can get, or these little devices that you can have on your desk. Um, I think they call them waifus or something. There's a, there was a weird uh, documentary on, I think it was Vice, um, where they talk about this, the, the rise of uh, the internet girlfriend. Um, and you look at it, you don't, you don't get excited about that kind of thing. Like it, it looks incredibly depressing. And I don't think um, that these, the people that have are like making do with it, like virtual girlfriends, I don't think it's based on the fact that they don't want a real girlfriend. I think it's just the, the only alternative they have. Like they've, they've got themselves into a position where they don't really know how to deal with people. And, and maybe this is a consequence of technology. Maybe like this kind of romanticizing um technology make, making it think making us think that if we were immortal that we would necessarily be want to be immortal with other people um and that if even if we were immortal with other people that that wouldn't come with its own problems yeah. and its own suffering and that you know that there wouldn't end up being um like wars on i think because it say you do manage to conquer um death to some degree with technology so you can replace your heart with some machine heart you can replace you know, other parts of your body with mechanical things, mm. um, which prevent a, a natural death. That doesn't mean that you can't get murdered, for example. Yeah, true. Um, like someone might still chop your head off and or like electrocute you and shut yeah, your components down. You yeah. might get um, viruses might become uh, viruses the, the way we see them on our computers. Mm. So, you know, if, if, if you're a completely mechanical being, you might have transcended the biological virus. Um, but then you've opened up the opportunity to be hacked, um, you know, and other kind of viruses, um, like specifically computer viruses. Mm. Um, so it, it's it's not clear that you necessarily can escape death, um, even if you do rely on technology. You know, like say, like if you manage to upload yourself onto a computer, well, okay, now you rely on the survival of that computer. Whatever that means, yeah, uploading. Yeah. Yeah. The computer isn't necessarily immortal. The computer. Yeah. It, Finally, yeah, I think that that's a very powerful point. Is that you, you're you're assuming death comes in only one shape and size, right? There's yeah, there's yeah. many ways people pass away, right? And this is final, and this ties in. Allah says every soul will taste death. Uh, so it's the, a lot. Some of this is a lot of wishful thinking. But let's go on to the next question, bro. Uh, Muhammad Samin says this is an interesting one. He says if AI becomes sentient, and let's discuss this. What does that even mean? Uh, would this that mean that Allah gave them a soul? Um, so, so I guess it ties in with, I think it all depends on what you mean by sentient here. 
right? Uh, so go on, bro. Let's get your thoughts on this, inshallah. Yeah, I don't think this is ever going to be the case. Um, I, I think this is based... Imagining that we can make AI, quote-unquote, sentient, um, it, it's sort of based on the presupposition um, that sentience or consciousness um, is material or is, is fundamentally like a, a mechanical thing um, and that there isn't something about consciousness that separates it um, completely from things. Um, and, and from that sense, it, I don't think it's necessarily possible that computers will ever become like conscious like we are. Mm. Um, the, if anything, we might be able to make them imitate. The, there yeah. was a, there's a philosophical problem that talks about this. There's like, there's a guy that's locked in a room and he has all these manuals that um, basically if, if someone posts Chinese under his door, he, he can look through the manuals and find the letters and if he finds the letters, they'll tell him what um, symbols to send back. And so he doesn't understand Chinese, but he's just he's got the the process in order to be able to make it look like he does. And so people on the other side are writing Chinese letters to him, posting them under the door. He's looking at them. He's finding, um, you know, the, the, all the information that he needs. He collects it and then he posts a note back under it. They read it and they feel like they're talking to someone. They feel like they're having a meaningful conversation, whereas the guy that's locked in the room has no clue what's going on. Like he, he, he has like he doesn't know what the conversation's about. Like it's not translated uh, into English or anything. He's just got like if A then B. If you know all these conditional statements. Um, and so you've got these people on the other side of the door. They feel like they're making a connection with a human being. They maybe mm. even they're falling in love. You get these people. They they fall in love with their computer programs. Yeah. They're, they're, they're virtual girlfriends. They feel like they've made a connection and they've fallen in love. Mm. But it doesn't mean that um, that person or that program or that thing has any idea what's going on. Completely yeah. clueless to it. Yeah, and I, I think there's layers to this, bro. Like for the first question, I, first thing I think about is, okay, assuming for a second that you can upload your consciousness, this we'll discuss that in a second, but you can upload it into a machine. Well, you, there's another underlying assumption there that you, from an Islamic perspective, that your consciousness is specifically your soul, right? It could be, we don't know how these realities really work in the what Allah's only given us a very little knowledge about the soul. Now, when we're referring to the soul, the ruh, are we specifically referring to human consciousness? Are they tied in? Are they tied together? What's the relationship between the two? Are they one yeah. and the same? These are, these are unknowns, right? Yeah. We can only assume about these things. So there's an underlying thing there as well that just because hypothetically speaking, if you could make a machine X conscious, it doesn't mean therefore it has a soul automatically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Logically follow. The other thing is this whole idea of uploading consciousness. Now, what really another thing that fascinates me from, a, again, from a materialist perspective, they, they would push when it comes to the consciousness. And I've got a, a live stream with Hamza on Monday on consciousness. I'm going to ask him the same question. They would push the idea that your consciousness is an illusion. There's the really sort of reductionist materialist naturalist, such as Daniel Dennett. He will push the idea. It's just an illusion. Sam Harris, it's an illusion. There yeah, is no yeah, consciousness. Yeah. It's just an illusion which is stimulated by the material physical brain. Well, if that's the case, well, what's there to upload then, right? You're not going to, you're not, yeah, there's yeah. Nothing that's going to be uploaded to the thing. Well, if you say, well, it's not your, therefore it's not consciousness that's being uploaded. What's being uploaded is what we're doing is we're, another view they can take is we're mapping the, the 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 brain from the perspective we're mapping all the neurons and all the firings and all of it we're mapping all of it out and then we're taking this mapping and we are we are coding it onto a machine uh well then if that's happening well are they it's not uploading you onto the machine it's just uploading a representation or an image of you onto the machine that's not you then right so there's a, yeah. there's a from that perspective but and of the questions of identity pop up here don't they like what is it that makes you you exactly um, and there's there's a similar um, issue that kind of explains this in terms of if you there was a machine that could destroy your atomic structure in one place and then rebuild it in another place identically without necessarily using the exact same material. Mm -hmm. So you know the atoms that have been destroyed over here yeah. stay over there, and then the new atoms are just put in the in an, in an identical place and built you again. Yeah. Um, would that necessarily be the same person? Um, and say you didn't destroy it, but then you did build it still. And then, and then there's two of you. Would you experience both of them? 
Yeah. Um, like, where, where does identity sit? So there's, there's all these philosophical problems about yeah, identity. Well, is, bro, and this is why I heard someone uh, recently, I don't remember who, I don't remember the name, but he said something interesting. He said, the ones that are really sort of all hyped up about uploading consciousness, et cetera, all of this type of stuff, it's mainly the, the uh, it's not the neuroscientists, but it's the uh, technologists, right? They're yeah, the ones yeah. all excited about it and giddy about it because the neuroscientists realize, well, look, we haven't even understood the most basic elements of the human mind and consciousness. You know, so to talk, to have talk of uploading it to a device is just absurd right now, especially in the times that we live in. I was listening to a lecture today earlier, bro, and the, the, the scientist, he made a very interesting point. He said, if you were to take the human brain and expand it out to the size of a city, he says that the neural connections will be the size of the, the, the grains of sand and there'll be trillions, millions of them. And each one would have molecules, millions of molecules that are vibrating in a particular way that are creating electrical impulses that are resulting in everything that's going on. He says to try and map this out, it's, it's almost an impossibility if you think about it, right? Well, this is, ties into an interesting problem. It's the, the human mind looks at itself and can't comprehend it. It's like, well, like I'm absolutely mental. Like yeah. there's there's so much going on here. Yeah. How can I encompass me? Mm. Um, and so you the mind can't look at itself because the mind is too complex for the mind to comprehend. Mm. So then what it does is the mind goes, ah, well, I'm too complex to comprehend. I'll make something that might might be able to comprehend it. But then the thing that we're making, i.e., technology. Um, become so complex that we can't understand that either. Mm. Like we we become reliant on, the, and he talks about it in this book as well in a, a later chapter about the the issue of al algorithms. Um, and the algorithms become so complex that they become beyond our comprehension as well. And so you you have this issue where we create where we can't comprehend ourselves, we can't comprehend the mind. So we try to build things to help us comprehend it, but then the things we build we can't comprehend either. And then they're supposed to like look at us, figure things out, and then tell us things. Yeah. But we're not sure what process is happening here. Yeah. We're not sure how it's dealing with that information, finding it out, <laughs> what it's doing when it's computing it, and then um, whether or not it's actually able to communicate that to us in a way um, that is supplying us with an actual truth. So this is kind of like um, Kant's problem about the, the thing in itself like how how do you know that the thing that you're building that you can't comprehend is actually finding truths out about the nature of you and then how do you know it's able to communicate those truths back to you because you can't comprehend how it works and in order to be able to guarantee um it's, a, it's an epistemological problem like how do you guarantee um that it's it, that it's it's successful in in transferring it's that information it's literally great. It's just it's just wishful thinking. That's essentially what it is, bro. It's like you're hoping things to fall into a particular order without understanding what those things are and how they work. Yeah. And it's crazy. It's based it's on a naive thing. hope, basically. It's like, ah, oh, and it's like... Again, you think about it, this, so. yeah, this type of hope highlights that there is, there, a part, uh, at least for a certain group of human beings, there is this, this, it's almost like this power trip. You know, like, you know, look at what we can do. We've got technology and, and now we can become, uh, you know, we're greater than God. We're going to become greater than God. It's almost, again, it's based on sort of wishful uh, thinking and this, this desire to outdo God in a way. Here's an interesting question by Social Stigmatist. He says, do you believe the birth and rise of super AI and le uh, leading a life of monotheism is incompatible? I'll, I'll pass that to you first, bro. That's a good question. Um do you believe the birth rate? I don't think it's incompatible. Um, like you don't see necessarily, like you see the increase of atheism, for example, um, but you also see the increase of populations in general. Like the populations are increasing rapidly. And so if there are huge numbers of people being born every day, it makes sense that you know even these small subgroups would increase as well um but you also despite this kind of rise in artificial intelligence and things like that um there's still a rise in religiosity there's still a rise in religious communities there's still people reverting to different religions um i think the the rise of ai is just a, a function of 
problem solving. Like there's certain things we don't want to deal with. And so we want to offload it onto something else. Um, and AI seems like it's, you know, there might be a solution to that. Um, but, but I don't think it's necessarily linked um, to like a, a decline in monotheism um, yeah. necessarily. Because like, you can still be a monotheist and use technology and use Siri or use whatever. Um, yeah. You know what I mean, but no, it's an interesting question. There might there might be something I'm overlooking as well. To me. well from a from a from a from a theological perspective, I don't see any issues at all because, like like we said, and some of the things we've been discussing today, uh, is that well, when it comes to the question of you know why are we here, we believe the ideas that we believe and what God tells us that there is only one God that He created everything that exists. Therefore, he cre created all the raw materials that exist and he created the human being and the human mind that has the ability to use these raw materials and to construct them in certain ways. Um, so it doesn't, there's a creator, it doesn't interfere with that, what you make from a perspective of technology. However, there may be elements which, which go against the ethic of Islam. There may be certain elements which uh, go against the teachings of the Quran. For example, I don't know. So taking something simple, simple like, okay, God created us to worship him, to know him and to worship him. If we move in a direction where technology develops in a way which somehow, I don't know how this will happen, but somehow prevents the human being from worshiping God, I don't know, hypothetically, for example, a human being has so much technology around him, he doesn't feel the need to get up, doesn't need He's to go to the, the toilet, himself. doesn't need to go to the toilet, doesn't need to do anything, therefore he just eats, becomes a couch potato, so much so he can't move anymore. <laughs> you know, he has he has issues, uh, and therefore he can't worship God. He can't pray. Well, then that, there's a problem. There's there's a yeah. technology is directly negatively impacted. Even even today, bro, we can argue that cell phones, uh, depending on how we use them, we can use them to such an extent that they prevent us from worshiping God and prevent us from fulfilling the purpose of our lives. Right? It could be used in that way. It's like a knife. You can use it in both ways. Yeah. Right? You can use it to cut vegetables. You can use it to kill someone. What, what's interesting here is it's not necessarily um, getting in the way of, say, monotheism, but in the practice, the practices. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, do you remember the film Wally, -E, where, like, they, <laughs> technology advanced so much that they'd all managed to, like, go out into space? Have you, have you seen that film? I haven't seen that, no. It's such a good film. It's, a kind of, it's, it's like a Pixar film, but it, there's this little robot that lives on Earth, and he's just busting about cleaning Earth, like, you know, like making rubbish piles. Up. And... Um, humans have left earth because they've made a mess of it so much and they're now floating around in space but technology has advanced that much that they're, they're now they're all just fat slobs <laughs> and they like technology just kind of functions every like does everything for them but i can imagine that you would maybe like if technology advanced to such a degree and ai was so interactive that maybe that it, it might make you forget things you know it might hide obligations from you if um like you get this experience at the moment just with twitter how hours can fly by all of a sudden now yeah. if technology is um developed to such a degree where you don't even have to worry about getting hungry for example you've just got like tubes that go into your back um that constantly provide you food um and nourishment so that you don't have to worry about getting up and eating and you know you're getting your water through there um, and then you, you've got this kind of device that you can sit in and like it moves you around and you don't have to worry about going to the toilet. Like all of it, like the input and the output of the body is completely taken care of. And then you've just got these kind of goggles on um, and you live in like a virtual world while you're just kind of sat in the seat um, that produces everything and takes everything away from you. Then maybe you might get sort of caught up in this virtual world where you don't realize how much time has passed. Yeah. And so I, you're not um, focusing on prayer times. You're not focusing on any of this stuff. Um, and so it, that might affect say the, you know, the practice um, of things. And th th I guess it might even make other things really weird. Like it, it would, it would raise some really interesting thick questions. Yeah. Like, I, like, um, I wasn't even thinking. I was thinking, yeah. that, I was thinking that right now. But I think, I think, as a, as a fundamental issue, as a general issue, is that that the world as a whole is not. Let's face it; they, they, they. Most people are unaware of their creator. They're unaware of their obligations towards their creator, right? So they don't know why they're here. God tells us in the Quran, He created us to know Him and to worship Him. Most human human beings have moved away from this. The secular world has moved away from this, and and the focus is progress. The, the bottom line is progress. 
in the worldly life, right? Progress in this material, physical life. And that means progress from all dimensions, every aspect. Now, if that's the fundamental philosophy and idea, well, then that's going to, and that's the direction, well, that's inevitably going to lead you away from what the truth is in every way, shape or form. And that includes, uh, you know, developments in technology as well, because the developments in technology, in most cases, at least, maybe not in all, would be geared towards facilitating that progress from a worldly perspective and not facilitating progress as far as your spiritual progress is concerned or you fulfilling the purpose of your life. So that fundamentally is an underlying issue. But then again, that applies to whatever's happening in the world today anyway, in in every way, shape or form. Yeah. And also, if the thing he's trying to show in this book that I was reading no longer is that technology is facilitating nihilism. Um, and if that is true, and it is facilitating nihilism, the you know the experience of this kind of like meaninglessness um, through the acts of self-hypnosis, um, you know, just the avoidance of consciousness. Um, if that's the case, and you know, the, there's a correlation with the increase of technology. You have the increase of a uh, of a nihilistic people, um, mm. and the more embedded in that nihilism they become, um, then I guess you know, from that perspective, it might end up having massive issues in terms of not just monotheism, but religion in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, bro. So it, it's interesting that you made that point, bro. So it, the way I'm seeing it is it's it's facilitating and upholding that nihilism you'll naturally arrive at through denying God. So it's almost making it easy for you now, the technology. It's keeping you distracted. It's keeping you plugged in. Therefore, you don't have to focus about the deeper questions of life. You don't have to look into the meaning of life. You're just too busy. You're too It hides your dependency as well. Yeah. Like um, you, because you, did you ever play one of them computer games on like the PlayStation and, and you, you got the cheat codes? Yeah, and it's like the games were always really, really hard. And then you'd be like, oh, no way, I can get um, all, unlock all weapons and have uh, yeah. you know, like, unlo I can refresh my life. And then all of a sudden, it, like, the game becomes really interesting for a minute, but you just become a psychopath and you just run around like shooting and blowing everything up and you're like fighting the army and what's not. Um, but it wears off. Mm. It gets really boring all of a sudden. And it's like, uh, and then you kind of want to go back to not using the cheats again and starting the game, you know, like uh, with the, the, the challenge, because the challenge is the thing that makes it fun. Yeah. Um, and so maybe you, we could look at technology as like a cheat. And like, you know, we, we're getting excited that we've got it now. But maybe once we... I'm going to let you carry on for 10 seconds, bro. I just need you pop off the live. I'm going to, you carry on. I'm just going to go out and come yeah, back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's nice. All right, let's have a look at um, what McKeith said here. So, those materialist and empiricism focused atheists who demand to see miracles uh, will get their wish. He's called the Dajjal. Uh, be careful what you wish for. Not everything that shines is gold. Yeah, that's a good point as well because it's. Um, so maybe this technologically advanced world as well as this kind of nihilistic world is is the you know ample grounds for the Dajjal to kind of um sneak in and get his basically yeah maybe that's the world he's waiting for um let's have a look at what else is being said here uh i'm just gonna work from the bottom rather than scrolling up so apparently someone's insulting his own uh can you imagine Oh, you're back. I was yeah. uh, I was going to read through the comments, but you got back before I managed. I don't know if you read the Mukid Khan's uh, question. I think it's quite an interesting one. Um, yeah, yeah, I haven't thought about it, but I think it's a good time. Let's just let's just just dabble with this and see where we go. He says, "Those materialist empiricists, focused atheists uh, who demand to see miracles will get their wish." Uh, he is called the Jal. Be careful what you wish for. Not everything that shines is gold. Let's yeah. Know. Well, I pretty much um, I'm, I read it and I mentioned a little bit on it. So I, I was saying that, um, yeah, because I was saying that the Dajjal, his the perfect environment for him would be a a one where like miracles are going to happen, obviously, and maybe technology might be the thing that would give rise to the miracles. Because another thing we need to consider is when technology advances, it doesn't um, it doesn't advance everywhere at the same time like we don't all get access to the latest technology it trickles down so the the people at the top the things that they have access to are, are mind-boggling like when when people go to like a rich person's house and the the tech that this house has got 
like all the things that I've got going on, it it blasts people's minds. Like they they can't get their head around it. And then as things become cheaper, they trickle down and then they become more available to the wider society. Now, if, if we think about the trend of technology um, where things become crazier and crazier and crazier and crazier, um, there's going to be a point where whatever technology, because it's exponential as well, so keep that in mind. So whatever technology is, is being made available to those at the top, to the elites, um, to those with all the money um, and the ability to purchase these things um, or to develop them, if they get access to them first, it might get to a point where it's indistinguishable from a miracle. If they yeah. can, you know, you know they, they, if they can manipulate matter, if they can manipulate um, energy, which I guess would be like maybe the ideal end goal of technology, like the ability to kind of be a god, like to, to fly, to you know, like <laughs> do all these mad little things. Oh, look who it is. It's a, uh, it's a, uh... We're maintaining some distance. He's trying, to, he's trying to attack me. Live on. <laughs> but um, yeah, so there's, it, it would maybe be indistinguishable from a miracle. And so if those people that are demanding to see miracles want them so badly, then, you know, they're, they're basically going to have someone that's just basically got a lot of money and has access to the technology, making yeah. it look like he has a miracle. Um. And then if that's what they're after, they, you know, when they see it, they'll fall for that. And then if this happens to be um, the, you know, a world that has increased in nihilism, nihilism has taken hold more so than ever. Um, at that point, people, because nihilism is just a void. Nihilism isn't the end goal. It's it's a transitional stage. Mm -hmm. um, like Nietzsche constantly refers to this as well. Like he says, like the, the aim is not to like, get to nihilism and then just sit there and yeah, we've got it. You know, it's, it, it's not the end goal. It's, it's the process of deconstructing what we have and preparing mm -hmm. a ground to build something new. But that's yeah. also perfect for the Dajjal. That's, that's exactly what he wants. He wants to destroy what everything, you know, everything everyone knows yeah. about the world um, and, you know, introduce something new. And, it, and that new thing could be a complete inverse of what was available prior to it. Oh, it might necessarily have to be an inverse of what was available prior to it. If it wasn't an inverse, then it's just building the same thing again, which is, is quite interesting. Um, Mohammed Salman Ertesum says... Sorry, uh, but what, you left the door open. Yeah. to go shut it. Um, no, it's all right. Sir. It's on live stream, I think, or something. Do you uh, want to say something about that? Or? Uh, no, to be honest, uh, I think there, there are some interesting parallels there because... You know, we are living in a world which denies God, has turned away from God. And we live in a world where people want to see uh, miracles. They want to see evidence. They want to see something tangible right in front of them as proof. That's just the way we're conditioned to think. So when Dajjal does come, and as we know from our tradition, he will show people miracles. He will show people things. Uh, so it's almost like people are primed from one perspective to, um, to accept him. Uh, and I can see how, how, and like you said, technology is, it's almost blurring the lines between, uh, you know, reality and magic in a way. Because if you take some of our technologies today, bro, and transport right. them, bro, mm -hmm. take, them for, take them to the time of the Prophet I mean, they, if they saw a phone, they pro, they, they'll probably think this is this is something just, you know. It, yeah. it is, I mean, if you remove... If, if you show them a screen, they're, they're looking at it and it's indistinguishable from like a block of material. Bro, Why can I see a face on there? What's going on? Subhanallah. Oh. You know, it, and, and this is the thing, it's it's almost like if you remove that barrier, if that 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 buffer of time, bro, uh, if, that we have have had for the progress of science, you remove that buffer, take this technology back 1400 years, and people will freak out, they'll think it's magic. Yeah, uh, literally. Yeah, yeah. So I can see how it could be used in the future by in the by the figures such as the Jal that, that emerge to lure people in. Um, but how that may I don't know how that may work, Allah God knows best. Man. Allah. Uh, here's a question by uh, Muhammad Samin again. He says, "What do you think of uh, transcending human, transcending humanity through sci-fi, uh, becoming energy, uh, being uh, or going into higher dimensions? Sound familiar? So you know all of these ideas that we have about interdimensional travel and time travel and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. moving on to a uh, to to some sort of higher realms, transcendent higher state, etc. Uh, what do you think of all of this stuff, bro?" Um. The thing is, is it's, it's, they are very interesting. Um, I read, I didn't read I'm lying. I, I watched um, uh, like a mini film based on the book of um, Flatlanders. 
and it, I really loved it because it made me think about these higher dimensions and things like that. And it and it also made me kind of relate it to my understanding of the jinn as well, because the jinn are said to be um, beings that you know they can see us, but we can't see them. Um, and basically, I when I was watching this film Flatlanders, um, and this there's a little short clip that Carl Sagan does on this as well. Um, I couldn't help but see the fourth dimensional beings that he was referring to as the jinn, um, and, and as being like these kind of transcendental beings that see things. So I, I wouldn't say it's it's that far fetched necessarily. Um, it's something I inclined to even before I was like a Muslim. Uh, like I did think of these things, you know, higher dimensions. Um, but it, it's one of them. It's not really much I can say without just pure speculation. Um, because the nature of the problem is, is that if these realms exist, they necessarily exist beyond the empirical senses, i.e., sight, smell, touch, taste, etc. Um, like, how would you, if they do exist, how would you prove them uh, in a way where the scientific community would be happy um, with what you're providing to them as evidence? Because, like, if it if it's if it constantly involves kind of moving away from here. And they're like, no, if you're going to show me evidence, it has to be here. Yeah. It's like, well, uh, you, you get stuck into a corner. It's like, well, even if it does exist, like you've written off the possibility of being able to prove it to yourself. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's a weird one. It's interesting, but. So, so really Muslims, we do acknowledge that they're, they're, they're very well, uh, you, you, what, what you would refer to as dimensions. Because even in the Quran, there are some very interesting passages in uh, Juz Amma. Uh, near the, the last part of the Quran, where the shorter and the f initial, the first revelations of the Quran are in the in the, as we find the Quran today, uh, the the first revelation of the Quran. There are some very interesting surahs uh, which speak about certain things, bro, which really give you a um, a sense of uh, you know something you know something you can appreciate today in the twenty first century, although you can't fully grasp it. Like angels ascending, uh, doorways opening or doorways opening up on the day of judgment, right? The, the, the sky opens up. Uh, they uh, and, and and passages like the, the sun, they're in I think it's Surah Shams, where this where the sun is mentioned to uh, to and the, the Arabic word is not coming to me right now. But it, the, when I, when I looked it up, the meanings of the word was the sun sinks in and it's wrapped up. The word signifies. And it's very interesting because. If you think about black holes, things sink yeah, in, sure. they're, they're wrapped up. So, so it, there are some things there, bro, which which really blow your mind from from the perspective of what's to potentially come, and things that that, that evade you from the times that we live in, and obviously uh, previous times, just because we haven't understood these things fully. Um, so, uh, there definitely is it, a concept. It, of, it also you, talks about the heavens being layers as well. Yeah, seven um, heavens, one above the other. There's there's uh, there's even narration of the prophet peace be upon him about the ring in the desert. Uh, and one heaven being as opposed to or compared to the other as being a ring in the desert and the next being a ring in the desert. Uh, so there are there there are what you can refer to potentially as dimensions. Uh, yeah. We call dimensions. Uh, but how these things work again? It's it's literally you know beyond us because Allah, well, um, Allah knows best. But but that's another fascinating aspect of the Quran that it does touch upon things which uh, uh, allude to sort of things that we may better appreciate today from the 21st century, although we don't fully grasp. Uh, here's an interesting point about Hassan. He says, I think human beings uh, are wired to endure some level of uncomfort, hence the nature of dunya. Interesting how the West strives to make life as comfortable as possible, yet they're the most miserable. And let me just broaden that out by saying well, what uh, the, 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 the ideologies of the West are literally global now, right? It's, it's a global problem from that perspective, which where, where the world seems to want to make life as comfortable as possible from a worldly perspective. Uh, what do you take? What do you make of that, Paul? What's any thoughts? Yeah, well, it's um, it's it is funny, but it's it's linked to this. The grass is always greener on the other side. Like you always, because it like even now. So like I think that anywhere that's not the West kind of wants to emulate the West, and and you see them slowly sort of morph to try to imitate that. Um, but then you look at the you know the people that live in the West, and you see the rise of this kind of collapsitarianism, um, this romanticizing of the end of days. You know the zombie apocalypse, mm. um, and like people were like, yeah, I'd be absolutely bossing that. Um, so yeah, there, there, there is. You know, the, the Quran says, you know, that um, man was made ungrateful. Like they're they're constantly, um, 
Like they, they then they're, they're never happy with what they have. They always want more. They always want something different. They you know they always want to move beyond what they've currently got. Um, and so, funnily enough, you you, you see that now we, we're pretty much living in what people in the past would call paradise. Like <laughs> it's mental. Like you, the, the convenience stores are so convenient. You go in there and there's like ridiculous. You, when you go there, you don't have to carry a big bag of gold. Like. You just you, like now I can use my phone to uh, I just go boop and it's there. Yeah, you've got my money now. So, yeah, actually, and, interesting. Uh, trans, some transhumanist, bro. I, I was watching a documentary, they're actually getting chips implanted into their hands, yeah. which actually you could pay literally with your oh, hand. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just it's crazy, man. It's fun. Like you could you can check out and you could just use your hand and touch the machine and you've paid for your, your items. It's fun, yeah, yeah, and um, there's all sorts of. Because there's there's even technology where like you you wear a particular chip, and when uh, rich people have this, and then each room has these things that recognize who's in the room, what uh, what chip is in there, and depending on who you are, you can set it yourself so that whenever you walk into a particular room, the lighting changes, certain music gets played, wow. um, something will pop up on the screen on the TV, um, you know your maybe. Yeah, your uh, social media will pop up on the, the devices in the room. And then when you leave the room, it all turns off. And then if someone else walks into the room, the room personalizes according to them. Mm. So like it's sort of in a way, you know, the kind of the personalization that you get on a computer where like everyone has their own um, username and password. And then when you log on, they've got their own desktop, their own apps, their own this. Um, it's like that, but then transferring it into the, um, the world. I can't remember why I mentioned that now. It seems like a bit of a tangent from the original question. What was it? To be honest, I've lost the original question as well. The original question was about, uh, what was it about? Uh, where is it gone? Probably a lot of, uh, I've lost it, Spanla. Anyway, I think it's good, on. That's good yeah. to keep to the next one. Uh, YC says, <clears throat> he says, every, every, everyone will technically uh, live forever. It's trying to escape death is what's wrong. Okay, so I get, so what YC is saying that, Life will continue. So this innate want that we have does actually uh, come to fruition, but it doesn't in this life. It comes to fruition in the, the next life after death. So it's death that's pe that people want to escape. But I, th I think I, I, I get a feeling, bro, that it's it's not only the pain of death, but it's the fear of accountability. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think I think the combination of those two things make that make it a very uh, uh, something you just want to avoid at all costs, bro. So it's like that insect with the red, the bright red markings on his body that you'd run away from, right? It's yeah. it's a combination of <clears throat> pain in the moment of death, but the 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 fear of accountability and what's to come. Well, oh. that's the thing. It's like so that this links into Pascal's wager. So it's like, well, you know, if uh, there's there's for you can you simplify there's probably a more complex version of this but there's, there's four outcomes either god does exist or he doesn't exist if he does exist and you choose to disbelieve uh you're in trouble if he does exist and you choose to believe uh, you know allahu akbar um if he doesn't exist it doesn't matter whether you believe or not like you know the outcome is is not different now the, the issue is is that if you've chosen disbelief they might say, "Ah, oh, well, you know, if you're believing, there's, you're not going to live life to the fullest." Blah 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 blah. Um, but then the problem is, is like this living, quote unquote, living life to the fullest is never necessarily. It, there's always a lot of naivety involved in it. It's always like, "I want this," and then when you get it, it's it doesn't satisfy. Like, you, it it never gave you what you wanted, and then you feel like, ah, and it, you're filled with regrets. You filled with this. You filled with that. And if you go through life. Let's say I'm right here. That you know the law of diminishing returns is is something inescapable. That no matter how much you kind of uh, dedicate yourself to this YOLO mentality, to living life to the fullest, all that nonsense. Um, if you do that, and it turns out that you never actually managed to get what you wanted, that you were constantly moving the goalpost. Like whenever you achieve something, you move the goalpost further and. And you, you 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 never get there. You're constantly chasing something. You get exhausted. Death starts to arise. Then all of a sudden, it's like ah, well, maybe I romanticized the YOLO mentality. Maybe it wasn't everything that I wanted. And you know, if it if it turns out that 
you know, the um, making the choice of disbelief, moving towards it, and living that kind of lifestyle. Um, if it wasn't as satisfying as it was, then the question of death being posed is something you, you might want to escape. Like maybe you feel like there is no um, forgiveness for you anymore. And so you, you would want to move away from it. You would want to escape it because you maybe you think, you know, I, I don't know, maybe there is a sense of accountability still. And, and you know that if you do die, that, you know, that it wasn't worth the gamble. No matter like how great of a quote unquote great of a life you could have lived on earth, um, that once death comes close to you, that it really wasn't worth it in the end. Yeah. Um, you know, that it wasn't all that it was hacked up to be, that it was um it was painted in glitter, but it's you know, its insides were filth. Um, so social stigmatist says try he's responding to Mukid Khan's uh, point or comment. He's and it was an interesting point he makes. He says transhumanists would argue by buying extra time, you have more time to spiritually develop, thus uh, defying uh, or uh, defining new concepts of morality. Um, so what do you think of this idea that someone may, some transhumanists may argue, well, look, by living longer, you have more time to grow spiritually and you have more time to develop morally and ethically. And therefore, in the grand scheme of things, you know, you are you are doing better anyway, even as a worshipper. Well, that's assuming that you don't become more nihilist. Mm. <laughs> and like if if living forever um, instills meaninglessness of like, oh, it's just repeating the same thing now. There's nothing new to experience. There's nothing blah, 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 blah. Um, like the, who's to say the idea of morality wouldn't just dissolve completely? Yeah. Especially yeah. when machines, machines take over or, or as they would, as they, some of them envisage it, that there'll be a world run of machine with machines, right? That, that yeah. machine robots and AI would replace human beings and humans may even become the slaves. So there's some really strange portrayals of the future, right? And yeah. think about such a world, bro. Like, I mean, think about machines and ethics. It's like, it's like, okay, like, okay, where is, you know, you're no longer the God of machines because you're the slave. Well, then what's what's dictating the moral code for machines? You know, yeah. where do they drive the morality from? Uh, it's not going to be us because yeah. the, be the, the slave the what does it mean to have be a moral machine, right? Uh, yeah. It's, there's some it's, it's a crazy there's some crazy things there um, let's see if there's any other questions bro and then we can wrap up yeah, it's getting to the end of the day now the, um, I, think, I, think the we're good, I think we're good so hopefully we've addressed most of the questions I know there were some repeats um, but just to, just to wrap up bro I think we've touched upon loads of points you know obviously it was just an initial type of discussions we, have, we haven't wrapped things up but just to try to give a summary conclusion from my end, and I'll get your, your take on it as well, inshallah, is some of the things that we've touched upon is that there seems to, obviously there seems to be this interest in this movement where, you know, humanity and machine become one in some way, shape or form. There are different varying ideas in regards to this. There are the simple type of ideas we simply, we, machines simply help us progress to becoming a type of superhuman, which not necessarily lives on forever, but lives a better life uh, lives a more fulfilling life and from that perspective if it's simple things like you know keeping you more healthy for example making you a bit more sharp intellectually uh, and you 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 use these tools or use this extra time to worship Allah and you like you know you can use your phone in a way where you can worship Allah for example you could download some very brilliant apps today Quran apps which literally bring the whole encyclopedia and library to your to your the palm of your hands and that's phenomenal bro right you don't have to spend millions or have access to a, a, a library of classical literature, you've got it all in your hands now. Yeah. That's facilitating, Allah's facilitating for you, and the, that technology becomes a means for you to worship Allah. So there is that element. However, there are some crazy elements to it and ideas, which is such as, you know, wanting to live on forever, uploading your consciousness in some way, shape, or form, and which seem to highlight or expose an underlying issue that, or an underlying reality of the human being that the human wants to transcend his limited temporal existence, wants to live on forever, wants to almost become God uh, in some way, shape or form. And, and, and well, the next question is, well, if this is a part of human nature, well, then we should probably look into what else or what that nature is actually telling us, you know, you know, that if we realize there's an innate drive to want to live on forever, then maybe that's, that should be a, a sign for us to reflect upon 
that reality, but not only limit ourselves to the world where we, which, which is temporal, which will end, whichever way you look at. Because one of the things we looked at, one of the things you mentioned, that okay, you you say you become bionic in some way, which from a a age perspective or aging perspective, you 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 transcend that. You live on for say four hundred years, but that doesn't mean you're not going to die in another way, right? It doesn't mean you're not going to yeah. get bus or not going to get a virus as computers get virus, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or or if you fall in a volcano and not, like yeah. no. <laughs> yeah, you're climbing a volcano for some crazy reason because your 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 I don't know your your feet now which are covered by some sort of it, w- it wouldn't. It wouldn't surprise me if, like, UFC evolved to some, like, if it was some transhumanist thing that there'd be sort of like <laughs> death, death battles on the edge of a volcano, yeah, and like the loser awesome. falls in. And- yeah, that would be crazy, man. But the point is that you can't escape death. Like, whichever. Way, if okay, if you escape all of these things, well, the universe seems like it's going to come to an end at some point anyway, right? So the, you you can't escape death from that perspective. So these crazy ideas are highlighting a nature which is trying to is is being expressed. And instead of trying to find that expression in this life, trying to live forever here, maybe you need to look into what's going to happen to you after death. Once you die, do you go on, right? You mentioned Pascal's wager, which was a very interesting point as well, which is we have all the reasons to believe and live a good virtuous life, right? Uh, yeah. Because there's nothing to lose and something for atheists and materials to consider. Um, another thing that really interests me is that if you logically follow through with atheism and naturalism, you end up with nihilism where well, life is meaningless nothing drives you, nothing motivates you, but yet still you want to live on forever or you have this desire to want to transcend life. Well, that desire is should highlight to you, well, there's more that atheism or naturalism from one perspective at least can't be true because it removes all meaning from you. Yet your nature it expresses itself in a way where it does want to live on forever. It expresses meaning. It expresses value. You know, and, and to, be, to, bro, to be very honest, like if to have progress in any way, shape or form, to want to better hum- the human race and to remove illnesses and diseases, these are these are these are ideas that are driven by meaning. These are ideas driven by value. But for the atheists and naturalists, they have to realize that you can't account for this meaning and this value and these concepts and ideas without God anyway. So it's again more reasons for you to move away from atheism and naturalism and to look into God's existence, etc. Um, and I guess to, to to tie things up from my end, what, the way I see it is. You know, and I've always said this, but I think for Islam, it has the answers to the solutions of humanity. You know, it addresses the human nature, addresses the human soul, it addresses the human intellect, it provides answers, it provides comfort, it provides reassurance, it provides you with a relationship with your creator, which will bring peace and tranquility to you in this life and in the life to come. You know, and, and it, it gives the human being what the human being is actually desiring, right? Um which we you highlighted in a very beautiful way throughout today's session that which technology is not going to do for you because it's not going to satisfy you in any substantial way, right? It's just going to yeah. plug a hole, deal with a uh, problem in a superficial way, and it's not going to deal with the cause, the root cause. Um, so yeah, that's that's my sort of take on it for now, bro. Let me know your thoughts, and then we can wrap up, inshallah. Yeah. So I guess the way I would conclude is to anyone who's doubting islam or you know is, is looking into it or is interested in it i i would kind of ask you to have a look at say um the you know the, the those who have quote unquote made it, it from a materialistic standpoint you know they, they have all the money they have everything they want now you, you you've got like a spectrum of how they kind of react to this but on, on one side of this scale, you have the people that try to sell you that life. Um, and they, when you really look at it and you kind of, you pay attention to what's going on, it's very shallow. It's very fake. You, when you look at, say, the, um, and I think they've even ended up admitting this, at least, you know, the Paul brothers. So you've got Jake Paul and Logan Paul. Mm-hmm. Logan Paul's had um, discussions now, I think, with Russell Brand, where he was kind of opening up to the fakeness of this mm-hmm. Um you know, they're trying to sell you the goal of, you know, that this YOLO mentality. You only live once, um, you know, success is in this life. You can do it. You can make it. Rah, 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 rah. Um, and like, they're, they're not even really happy. They're just selling you something because they, they feel like success is, you know, um, having loads of subscribers or having loads of money. Um, and they're not even necessarily buzzing with what they have. You know, they've set their goal even further. Um, and don't think that that wouldn't happen to you if you got to where they are now that you'd just be like, yeah, I'm buzzing now. 
leave it there, as if you wouldn't want to to move the goal even further as well. Um, and then you look at say, like the the other side of the spectrum where they're not necessarily trying to sell it to you, um, but where like you know they opt out, i.e., they commit suicide. Um, you look at some of the happiest people, or that you thought that they were happiest people. Robin Williams being a great example of that. Like I always saw him as just like like it, it, that was mad when I found out he committed suicide. I, was like, I didn't even know he was depressed. I thought he was the happiest guy on the planet. How did that happen? And, and he, he, had, he had a lot of psychological issues, man. He was yeah. on medication and everything. And, uh, and the, the, that's another thing. Jordan, Jordan Peterson is is going through something right now. He's on medication yeah. himself. Um, and it, it's it's a common trend. Like either they're trying to sell you it, and when you look at it, it's obviously shallow. It's obviously fake. It's obviously they're just trying to sell you a product, for, you know, for their own benefit. Uh, because it, that they think that that's where success lies. Um, the, and then eventually they end up not being fulfilled by that. Eventually they end up having to deal um, with the burden of consciousness. They, they, eventually they get depressed. Eventually, um, you know, the reality of being a human sinks in. And they, they constantly have to remind everyone, you think this is success. Like it's not like we, when you get this, you don't get happiness. You... <laughs> You get more problems. Like, they, they make songs about it. More money, more problems. More, like the, the the more power you have, the more responsibility you have, the more burden all of this becomes. Um, now, if if that's the case, that you know, like the the lifestyle they're saying, like you know, with the Pascal's wager. Um, oh well, if you if you choose the theistic option, then you you're missing out on living life to the fullest here now. Um, <laughs> with the evidence doesn't seem to suggest. That if you pick that option and move towards that goal, that you get what you wanted at all. That, that like it, it screams the complete opposite. It everything about um, Pascal's wager in this case and moving in that direction and like moving in the direction of disbelief and trying to live a YOLO lifestyle, it, it doesn't lead to ultimate satisfaction. Yeah. Um, it doesn't at all. Now keep that in mind constantly, and and then. Read the Quran and look at how it talks about these things and how it draws your attention to these things and how it, it draws your attention to the, the fundamental aspects of what it means to be a human and take it seriously because that, that's the major step. The first time I read it, I wasn't really taking it seriously. I was an atheist at the time and I felt like it was just shouting at me. So I got a bit offended and <laughs> I was like, oh, and then I got annoyed and like moved away from it. It, I, it wasn't until like maybe the second or third time I read it um, when I was like, no, I'm going to take this seriously for a moment. Um, I'm going to take the assumption that maybe I'm wrong. Maybe the, this reaction that I'm getting is is from a sense of guilt or shame, and maybe there's a truth in it. Maybe maybe my, maybe I'm recognizing this, and it's just my like uh, annoying teenage uh, disdain for authority that's <laughs> making me reject it, and. To read it, take it seriously, and really think about it. Because it, what struck me when I was reading the Quran is just how much it seemed to know about the human being. Mm -hmm. Like how it seems to recognize a lot of the fundamental issues and how a lot of the things that it was suggesting as solutions were solutions. Like you implement them, and then, like, subhanAllah, like your, your life improves. You, and it, it doesn't necessarily grant you material success. Like, you're not necessarily going to become famous just because you've taken your shahada. You're not necessarily going to become wealthy or rich. Um, but you you begin to see life as a challenge. You know, people word it as a test. You can call it a test. You can call it a challenge. You recognize it as a challenge. You recognize that suffering is, is part of that. You stop seeing suffering itself as an evil. Um, and you start to see, you know, suffering as an opportunity for you to rise ranks, to make, you know, to, to, um, to become great. To become, and, and and not in like this pathetic sense, in, in in the eyes of other people, you know, you're you're not becoming great, um, you know, from the standards of Jake Paul or from Justin Bieber or you know any next man celebrity. You, you're becoming great in the eyes of uh, that which sustains everything. With be was flooded with meaning again. Life, uh, th th its purpose became clear. It like th and the truth of the human being became more and more obvious and the, the, the falseness of like this modern society and its obsession with technology and its obsession with what it refers to as progress. Um, 
it, it, it its hollowness becomes revealed. And, you know, people are infatuated with it. There's probably people in the chats section that are still infatuated with it. And, you know, Allahu Alam, time will tell who was right, who was wrong. Um, but, you know, from what I've experienced so far, um, the, an the answer isn't with atheism. The, the answer, uh, and it, there's this thing as well, that things that uh, the philosophy students in my class would say, um, the atheists, uh, oh, well, you've got to be able to make your own mistakes. And it's like, well, not necessarily. Like, a wise man can learn from the mistakes of other people. Like, I don't need to get addicted to heroin to go realize, you know, that's not a good thing. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I don't need to make that mistake to learn from it. I can look at, like, you know, the fact that my father passed away because of a heroin overdose, and I can learn from his mistake. I can learn from, like, uh, the mistake of others. And, and that is a clever thing to do like yeah. it would be it would be silly uh to have to learn from your mistakes it, it, you wouldn't call that wise um you know having an answer revealed to you and then still thinking ah well what do i really know if i don't do it myself um you, you can learn from the mistakes of other people um and i'm i'm asking or imploring that you learn from my mistakes like i, I i've come from this world and i I do not praise it in a complete sense that, you know, there are benefits, there are things that I will praise. Like, you know, I am grateful. There are blessings manifested here. So, you know, I am grateful for the fact that food is, is very easy to come by, that I don't have to starve, that my, my daughter was not going to have to deal with some of the issues that other people on the other side of the world do. You know, Allahu Akbar. And, but there's, there's, there's a dark side to every shiny coin and personally I've experienced them. And I know many people who have, and I know many, many people that still do. And I think it, like you, you know, if you want, if you're really that desperate to, to learn from your mistakes, you know, go ahead, pick uh, disbelief, move towards that lifestyle, um, go for the YOLO. And, you know, I, I have a feeling that, in, you know, as, as you get older and as time kind of moves on, uh, you'll you'll see what I mean. You'll you'll see the law of diminishing returns take effect. You'll see the things uh, lose their grip on you. The things that gave you pleasure at one moment cease to give you pleasure at another. The 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 need intensifies. The dosage needs to be increased. Um, you know, we're we're finite things with goals that move without an end, um, and that they can never be fulfilled, not on this earth anyway. And uh, so take that into account. Take. Islam seriously. Read the Quran. Um, look into other religions as well. Like I'm not telling you just to only look into Islam. I, I looked into Buddhism. I looked into Christianity. I looked into Judaism. I looked into Hinduism. Um, and you know, if you're sincere, I honestly do believe from the bottom of my heart that the, you do get led to Islam. Um, and you know, inshallah, that'll be the case for anyone in the chat listening now. Exactly. But, um, so, probably best to leave it there. Uh, really, really beautiful mm -hmm. summary, bro. And you know, for those that say they want to learn from their own mistakes, well, why don't why not make the mistake of approaching Islam in the Quran? And uh, <laughs> yeah, stop, right? so that's that's one that's a mistake you can make according to you. Um, yeah. So 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 definitely definitely check read the Quran and say, and, and I think it summarizes it, essentially. I think is a good point of summary, which is anything else from a worldly perspective, bro. No matter what it is, if it's chasing you know your pleasures, your desires, drugs, alcohol, technology like we've been talking about today, right? Uh, it's not going to bring satis satisfaction to your heart. It's not going to bring satisfaction to your soul. You're just like your body, you know, is it, when it feels hungry and it's starved of food and water, you feel it and you need that which will replenish it and that which will take care of that need. In the same way, your soul, when it's hungry, it will let you know it's hungry and it's letting people know it's hungry. But And people are searching to feed it, but they don't know what to feed it with. And what you're saying and the way you beautifully summarize is that from your, learn from your experiences, what fed your soul was the truth from God was Islam. Uh, yeah. And implement, not only knowing it, but implementing it to your life. And that, 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 that's what brought you to, essentially brought you to life. And, and like you said, it colored everything in your life and the world around you in a way, in a very profound way, in a true way. And, yeah. and it gave things meaning and it injected the true meaning back into life. And that's very similar to what I experienced too, bro. Um, yeah, and as well, I, I don't want to um, give the impression that I'm some sort of super muzzy. Like I, 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 I still have sins. Like I still have shortcomings. I still 
um, suffer. I still cry. I still, you know, feel pain. Um, and that, that there's things that I need to improve on and that there probably always will be, mm. um, you know, but I, I recognize that now. And like, I don't hide away from it. You know, like I, I know, you know, I, I have shortcomings and, but bro, I, I think that's one of the important steps. Is just kind of it's smiling. Like, isn't it beautiful that we we have a creator that forgives as soon as we turn back to him sincerely, and he'll yes. forgive over and over again, bro. No matter how many times you you err or make mistakes, you know, and he acknowledges that you are created in a way you will fall short. So that shouldn't be a barrier between you and him. Yeah. You know, that's something yeah, to not right. lose hope, God. not lose hope, but sincerely turn and ask for forgiveness when you you do fall short. Yeah, you do make mistakes. Um. Because you know, at the end of the day, we're human, and we're going to do that. Verily, in remembrance of Allah, do hearts find rest. Definitely. Yeah, I think that's where we could conclude, bro. It's probably the most beautiful point that we can conclude on, uh, is that for people to, to just to turn back to the Creator, man, and just, you know, just don't let life pass you by without figuring out what it's all about. And and li trying to live by it. Not that free, like, no one's gonna like like you said, you've got mistakes, bro. I have many mistakes and issues. Everyone has issues, right? No one's perfect. Uh, but it's a very special thing when you when you stumble upon and you realize and you figure out why you're here and, and who put you here and what your relationship with that being is. And and that is the most profound gift any human being can be given. And all it requires, bro, and I'm sure you'd agree, all it requires is on the part of the person to be humble and to be sincere. And just to have an open mind and heart. That's all it yeah. takes. Smiling. Forgiveness is um, literally one of the most beautiful things ever. Now, it, and you'll get small tastes of that. Um, if you've ever done something wrong and someone has honestly forgiven you, and you, as, especially if you've done something and you, you really recognize that you didn't deserve forgiveness. Like that person was well within their right to not forgive you, to write you off. Um, you... Uh, People experience this mainly with their mothers. Mothers are really good at this. Um, they give you an eye into what forgiveness, true forgiveness is like. You're like, you wrong, you don't deserve it, but they forgive you anyway. And um, subhanAllah, like, that is intensified a million, well, countless uh, times um, when you experience the, the realization of the forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like, he's not just forgiving one act. He's not just forgiving the things um, that are known to people, you know, that are out in the open. He, he's forgiving the things um, that you've kept secret from people that no one knows other than you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like, he's, he, if you turn to him sincerely, he forgives all of that. Um, and subhanAllah, that is intensely more beautiful than the already beautiful experience of just being forgiven uh, in a finite sense by another human. Um and you know, if, if if I could give anything to anyone, I'd give them that experience. But inshallah. Bro, Zakala Khair, may Allah bless you. I think what we should do for the next one is we should sort of change gears and just talk about your experiences and you coming to Islam and some of the things that you've stumbled upon along the way and some of yeah. the life lessons and things we could share that may help. You know, let's give people I guess a different perspective. Let's let's you know, let's put aside the logic, reason, science, philosophy for for, for the next one and let's really talk about the spiritual. Uh, dimension of of life, inshallah. I right, think inshallah. Be, I think there's that element to you, bro, which needs to come out. And I wanna, I wanna, I wanna be the one that captures it on the channel, bro, inshallah, because there's a, there's some inshallah. depth there, mashallah, uh, which we need to which we need to benefit from. May Allah bless you, bro. We will, we will, you we will peace, inshallah. Uh, Jazakallah khair, brothers and sisters, for coming online. Uh, I know it's been a long one, two hours, just coming yeah. up two hours now. Uh, and hopefully it's been beneficial. You guys have got taken something from it. Apologies from me first and foremost. Uh, for not, I'm not too good at going through comments. I'm going to make sure we do that better next time that we go through comments as we go along and we address them as we go along, inshallah. Uh, okay. Make sure to go to Yusuf's channel. Uh, tell us tell us your, your 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 YouTube and where they can find you, bro, and uh, your, your My, Facebook. YouTube so. channel, Pondering Soul. Um, I have Facebook, Pondering Soul, but Facebook's a bit weird. I've only got like 130 followers. Um, if, but it should be in the description box here. I, I've also got in, I've got Instagram. Instagram is at Yusuf Pondering. Twitter is Yusuf Ponders. Um, but like, yeah, like I say, if, if you want to follow us on any of them, uh, inshallah, it should be in the description box of this video. Um, so, uh, so brothers and sisters, until next time, take care, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.